Yeah. So on Friday, um, we finished our uh, our little demo, or our little lab for um, building your own biocontainment unit, and I showed you guys um, an example of uh, mailing biocontainment unit um, instructions from uh, the post office. And so, moving on, we have um, medical safety and, um, and biocontainment. So, uh, hospitals are one of the biggest concerns for biocontainment. We deal with infectious disease in hospitals all the time. And so, it's no surprise that there's a lot of regulation and um, uh, training that goes into making sure we don't cause infection in the hospitals, which sadly occurs on a regular basis and is um, still a big problem. Ways to prevent that include um, the standard precautions, which have been around for over four decades. Um, and they uh, are essentially rules for hygiene in medical settings um, to sterilize and, uh, and wash everything that you use and prevent um, coming in contact with infectious substances. Um, Hand hygiene is number one important. We touch everything uh, that is contaminated and we wash our hands uh, if we do that. So uh, wearing gloves in in medical facilities is, is a primary concern uh, for spreading infectious disease because they're disposable. They are not permeable to infectious disease. And uh, even with gloves, standard precaution says you have to wash your hands. So take off gloves, wash hands, put gloves back on when you come back in. It's all really rigid and structured. And I don't know if you can see that down there, but um, when you come in contact with any body of fluid, bodily fluids like blood, um, any open wounds, or um, the mucous membranes, you know, face, um, any orifice is primary concern for infectious disease transmission. Um, surface hygiene, we have medical tables and we work with um, patients on tables and beds. So we have to make sure that the surfaces are clean because we have multiple people using them, um, including physicians that have medical tools on, on, on tables. So they have to be sterilized and clean. Uh, bodily fluids or surgery, they have to be um, washed away and then sterilized, uh, and that's usually done if, um, in the worst case scenario, so really uh, high risk of infection, uh, they usually use bleach, so like 1 to 10 ratio water to bleach and, and, um, uh, for sterilization. Uh, respiratory hygiene, with, with respiratory uh, infections like um, indicative of coughing and sneezing, uh, those are really, really hazardous because that means that transmission is really, uh, really likely. So, just anybody who's in the hospital is advised to cough away from other people and preferably in their arm or into their hand and wash their hand or any tissues. And that's usually provided by the hospital. Uh, and they also have um, alcohol gels. If you've ever been in a hospital, they should have alcohol gels in just about every room um, set up on the walls for um, handheld disinfectants and um, uh, waste containers everywhere so we make sure that we're not leaving things around. Um, in, extreme, in extreme cases in infectious environments we use surgical masks and, and things like that. Um, like um, uh, uh, more more infectious disease uh, is uh, airborne that, that is, is, uh, is the primary concern for biocontainment because airborne is, like I said, the most, um, most uh, widespread uh, pathogen. Uh, other, other protective equi uh, equipment uh, include gowns and gloves and masks and face shields. Um, and hairnets, hairnets are, are less common, but again, more personal protective equipment. Um, and biohazard bags, we, we have biohazard bags in this room right here, and um, 
we uh, put uh, biological materials, blood, uh, needles, uh, used in hospitals, or always go into um, hard cases, which uh, aren't bags. They have uh, uh, separate separate containers for hard uh, for sharp materials, which um, prevents puncturing and work like that. And they're destroyed or uh, destroyed at medical waste facilities. Um, and they should always be filled up to only two thirds the the height or the maximum capacity, so that we don't have any overflow uh, of sharps materials. So that when we move them, we don't accidentally spill them, and um, we have some room to make sure as a buffer to prevent uh, spilling. Um, so how this relates to global health is uh, it's a huge concern for everyone. Not just hospitals, not just um, not just scientists, but everybody. It's every, in everybody's best interest to follow at least you know minimum safety precautions for preventing the spread of infectious disease. Um, some of it's kind of common knowledge, just you know washing hands when you cough and things like that or sneeze. Um, but uh, some of it's not so not so uh, obvious and uh, it can make a big difference. So we, uh, we have a, a lot of concern, especially in the last decade or so, about uh, international flights um, spreading, trans uh, transmitting infectious disease. So we have, um, uh, what's it called? Um, Lung-borne. SARS? Not, not SARS. Um, pneumonia? N not pneumonia. Um, tuberculosis. Tuberculosis. Uh, uh, tuberculosis, uh, especially uh, antibiotic resistant tuberculosis spreading across borders um, through flights and things before they're detected uh, because they have, uh, they have an incubation stage where it doesn't show up and it, it, it's most, most infectious um, when we can't really detect it. So, um, we have an organization called the World Health Organization, which, uh, whose primary concern is um, to prevent the spread of infectious disease. Um, and they meet in Geneva, Switzerland, and um, they're primarily the United Nations, uh, which formed the World Health Organization, and they uh, release papers and um, studies for, uh, for the uh, status of global health. And one of the recent ones was SARS. So um, that was a while ago, but uh, I, I remember it, and I don't know how many of you remember it, but we had um, a SARS epidemic in China and um, several other Asian nations, where in 2002 and 2003, we had uh, a couple of cases of a, an unknown pneumonia-like disease, and it ended up being a, a minor pandemic, or minor, minor epidemic. Um, it, it killed 10% of the people that were infected. And uh, the SARS coronavirus is much like influenza, but um, it uh, incubates for a long period of time. Um, so we have November uh, through February of um, 2003, where we get reports. And then all throughout the year of uh, 2003, up to June, we had um, 8,400 people in Asian nations uh, infected by SARS. And so the World Health Organization took it, um, took action uh, immediately because it was a uh, really big threat, in, especially in, in China, because we have a lot of, um, a lot of international flight to and from China. Uh, and uh, what they did was, was they basically set up a very large network of, uh, of um, scientists across the world uh, to try and identify where every case was um, was um, springing up so they could positively identify SARS uh, and try and prevent its spread wherever they could find it. And they were successful, whether it was a, a mutation or uh, whether it was due to um, tightened security and, um, and medical practices, uh, 
isn't exactly certain, but what, what is certain is that the last case of SARS um, was, uh, was, per, was basically, SARS was basically um, contained in 2003, so it didn't last long, but it had the potential to become uh, a global epidemic. Um, it still exists, but only in animal populations, and it could, could rise again in humans, but um, the risk is much lower than it had it become more uh, dominant in human areas where uh, medical facilities weren't readily available. So another really uh, big uh, factor about global health and containing infectious disease is uh, we, we don't think about it uh, a lot, but it's the cost of it. Uh, we lose in nations that have um, higher rates of infectious disease. We lose uh, tourism, uh, tourism inflow of, uh, of money. Um, we lose labor from people who are sick. We lose uh, investments from investors who don't want to invest their money in a region that has got a lot of infectious disease. Uh, and the public health care costs are huge. And even though SARS only lasted less than a year, its uh, costs were over $60 billion in Asian countries. Um, and uh, it would have been a lot less if there were, uh, if, if were, there were um, preventative measures that um, stopped it from, from becoming an uh, epidemic. So, like I said, the risk is, is ever present and we can't really have enough um, regulation in, in the hospitals to, to prevent it. There's always going to be infectious disease in the foreseeable future, so uh, whatever we can do to prevent that is is, um, is within our means, and uh, we just have to do it. The um, cost is always going to be higher if we let infectious disease uh, uh, strike first and then treat it later. Um, prevention is the best uh, policy, and uh, especially in developing countries where um, medical aid is desperately needed with, um, with concerns for uh, infectious, infectious disease. They have no way to prevent it, and they um, make it much, much harder for future uh, infectious disease, or much easier for future infectious disease to spread around the world. So um, it's in our best interests, and in developing nations' best interests to um, help uh, developing, or develop nations' best interests to help developing countries um, with infectious disease. And, uh, Done?